Spirit world, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for communing with us in this ritual, for spiritual enlightenment and transformation. With so much violence and uncertainty going on in the world, there are things to be grateful for. We have so many things to be grateful for. We are grateful for Black grandmothers that made yeast rolls and prayed on swollen knees for the survival of Black children. We are thankful for Black grandfathers that earned pennies as butlers, porters, and elevators operators to send Black children to school. We are thankful for Black mothers that washed clothes by hand in bathtubs so that children could have clean clothes for school and church. Hey, we are thankful for Black fathers that worked in fields and often worked far from home so that fried chicken and green beans could be served hot at the dinner table. We are thankful for Black aunties that taught Black children to braid and press hair and to walk in high-heeled shoes. We are so thankful and proud of Black uncles that taught Black children to dance and told unforgettable stories of the past at family reunions. We are thankful for Black sisters that rummaged through drawers looking for secrets and wisdom. We are thankful for Black brothers that fought off bullies at, at school and on the playground. We are thankful for Black cousins that played hide and seek and made mud pies with us during summer vacations. We are thankful for Black bodies that continually endure the ontological terror and violence of white colonization. We are thankful for Black minds that fight against embedded theologies of self-hate and self-degradation. We are thankful for Black thought, for our creative imaginations and ancestral memories. We are thankful today. Spirit world, we thank you. We thank you, we honor you, and we will continue to verbally say so. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. I was in my car a few days ago and this affirmation hit me. Um, I was on the expressway going up 75 and you know, right when you get to that Grady area, it just, you know, shuts down for absolutely no reason at all. And so, um, you know, I'm going in my lane, I'm moving. And then as I'm looking over at the other lanes, um, I'm just like, it seems like the lane that I'm in is the one that's not moving, you mm -hmm. know? And so I say, I'm just gonna find my opportunity Y'all are moving quickly, quickly. I just like jump over really, really quickly uh, when I can find a spot. And then like, as soon as I jump over, that lane stopped and the lane I was in, like rushed <laughs> and started going. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my gosh, like this whole time, this lane has been sitting there still. And then as soon as I move, now it's gone. You know, mm -hmm. and it was just so frustrating because it felt like I had to keep jumping in the lane and try to figure out, okay, which lane is about to start moving now. You know, um, it was kind of like a game at this point. And um, I thought about the affirmation um, and discipline and staying in your own lane. And like, sometimes it really, really, really do seem like th my lane is the only one not moving. And I'm like, I've been doing what I'm supposed to be doing, you know, X, Y, Z, and all these other lanes around me, it seemed like everyone is like rushing past me, getting to their destination quicker. And then the second that you move from where you were, mm -hmm. then now you are, either what sometimes further back than where you would have been if you would have just stayed consistent good. and doing what you were already doing. So good, Mole. And, I'm sorry. I said that's so good. It's oh, so I'm sorry. Good. So good. Yeah, so I was like, I was sitting there like, why, 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 why? Does it seem like any time that um you try to stay consistent, it seems like you're getting, and I'm saying seems, you know, because it's not true, but it seems like everyone is passing you, you know. But like mm -hmm. I learned that staying consistent, staying dedicated to a thing, um, staying disciplined in a thing, even if things seem unfair, even if, you know, it seems like I'm not getting the recognition that I'm supposed to be getting. Hmm. Everyone Say else it, is sir. getting a round of applause and no one is recognizing my hard work. You know, yeah. no one is seeing the, like how far I've really come. Stay Ooh. consistent in that thing. Stay you in that lane. Yes. If God showed it to you, if God said that this is what you're supposed to be doing, stay yeah. right. Yes, yes, yes. And yes. at the time that oh, it's time no for lane. your elevation, you're gonna shoot and nothing's gonna be able to stop you. 
And mm. it seems like every single person that's been rushing past you, they're going to watch you move. Listen. And it's not, mm. not to um, create it. jealousy or anything like that. But it's just what God has for you, it is for you. Well, and it's you going know, to happen. Listen. And everyone that has doubted, everyone that has progressed, you know, got things that Girl, they didn't here. deserve, things that they didn't even deserve. Those are going to be the ones watching you elevate and clapping for you. So just stay strong, stay disciplined, Woo! and don't move your lane. Just don't for move. Any, anything, do not move. Stay right Bad. there, and you will get to your destination. <laughs> thank you, and thank everyone for being here. And I just uh, want to give praise and thanks because it's such an honor to have this opportunity at the behest of uh, Queen Pastor Maisha Umi, also of many names, Reverend Dr. Handy. Uh, to speak, speak in this moment. I want to thank everyone who's preceded me because everything has been said fits so well with this day and what needs to be said. Now, the passage that we have before us is um, the lectionary passage from Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 40. And I will read them and then announce my specific focus uh, from this passage. And we have here, of course, the lectionary reading was, was what I just mentioned, but this is the part that I also want to call attention to because I will talk about the entire chapter. Well, on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead, he is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the 11 and to all the rest. Now it was Mary, Madeline, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Again, but these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. <laughs> Thank you so much for showing that uh, passage of scripture. And I want to look at everyone. Uh, on the screens, I want to invite you to repeat along with me. And they did not believe them. Let's say it together. And they, and they did, did not, not believe, believe them. them. So my focus for the time we have together is they were there first. They were there first. This is the third Sunday of resurrection. Oh, that's beautiful. And I know that we have gotten accustomed to, as I have also, of thinking about uh, the resurrection season beginning on Holy Thursday with the anointing of Yeshua's feet and with the Passover and with the uh, trial and the death and then the resurrection almost as an anticipated liturgy 
over the centuries that we've done this so long now. And I know also on Good Friday, especially, we love to preach those seven last words of Yeshua. I have a sister friend who says, it's amazing that Yeshua on the cross says more words than any brother ever has to say when he's not on the cross. <laughs> but we give him seven last words and we preach those sermons. He's waxing on the cross. But you know, for the past year, almost two actually, I've been talking about and been doing explorations in Monday night on what happened to the divine feminine presence in the Bible and in the culture of Yeshua. And I've been doing that in order to lift it up in my own imagination, but also in our imagination, not taking anything from the divine masculine, but to lift up what happened to the divine feminine in the text and what happened in culture the image of the Imago Dei, not only as masculine exclusively, but also, and maybe preeminently from a West African point of view, as feminine. That the sacred holy mothers who give birth to all of us are the ones who then shape and form all of us, male and female, in the image of divinity. And for the first time since we've been doing this study, I recognize something I had not paid attention before either. I noticed that in resurrection consciousness and in the resurrection narratives, all four of them, the women were there first. The women were there first. They were on a mission to do something inexplicable to the body of Yeshua. So they were there first as priestesses in a way of speaking. If you're in my Monday night class, you know what I'm talking about. But not only that, <laughs> the women were there as the first disciples to either see the angels and or Yeshua. Not only that, the women were there as the first evangelist because they were sent to speak the good word, Uangelion, the good word to the other disciples. And then finally, the women were there first as the apostles, huh, because the word apostolos means someone who's sent with a mission, because they were sent to give a mission. They were there first as priestess, they were there first as disciples, they were there first as evangelists, they were there first as apostles. And what's amazing is that in all of the gospels, this is mentioned that they were, they were there first. And what's more astounding is that in several of them, Mary Magdalene is presented as it were the chief witness of both the angels and of seeing the post-resurrected Yeshua himself. Brothers and sisters, have we ever really thought about the significance of that? I hadn't until recently that these women, and not unknown, not unnamed. By my count, there are at least six women who were there in one way or another. I already mentioned one, and it's mentioned in the text. There's Mary Magdalene. There's Joanna. There's Mary, the mother of Yeshua, his own mama. There's Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. There's another Mary who is the wife of Clothus. And finally, there's Shalom. Six women who in one way or another were the priestesses, disciples, evangelists, and apostles. And I've said this also on Monday nights. They were also the ones who helped to bankroll Yeshua's mission. They helped to take care of Yeshua and his disciples while he was still on this side of the veil. Now, the song we just heard, I want to really resonate with so that we also remember 
then Yeshua had been assassinated. Yeshua had been executed for political reasons, for insurrectionist reasons, for countercultural reasons, for liberationist reasons that were multidimensional, not just spiritual, but multidimensional. That his message was an assault on the Roman Empire. And his message was an assault on the client state that had become so in Palestine. That it was an assault on the physical, social, political, and economic status quo. And this is why this black man died. This is why this black man was nailed to a cross. This is why this black man had been beaten. And this is also why I believe his brothers are hiding out for fear of execution upon themselves. This story is so contemporary that it's mind boggling. And that's the point, beloved. Yeah. That this story is so relevant. When we take all the veils of a false spirituality and get down to the nitty gritty of why he was here, what did he do, how he was convicted, and how he died, and how many of his disciples were left hopeless. I want you to say hopeless. Hopeless. They were justified in their fears. They were justified in their trepidation. They were justified in their anger. They were justified in their anguish. And they were justified in hiding away. I wanted to get that. And at the same time that the brothers were justified in what they were doing, six women couldn't wait to get up and go and do their duty. Go and fulfill their responsibility to take care of the body of the Mashiach, the body of their king and their community, the body of their beloved one. Despite the patrols, despite the hits, despite the fear, they got up. Now they got up Huh. in a way of speaking, before he got up. Because we don't know the exact time. But they got up before he got up to go and get him ready. Hear that? They got up before he got up to go get him ready. As a king should be. As a pharaoh should be. As a Canaanite should be. On their way, we are told in other places, they wondered who had rolled the stone away. But isn't it peculiar that even though they knew the stone was rolled away, they were on their way. Even though they knew well, the stone needed to be rolled away, they were on their way. We're talking about discipline. We're talking about determination for this month. Well, these sisters had it. When they got there, again, based on various accounts, there were either one angel or two men or one angel, but they were all told the same thing. I'm sending you, go back and tell the others who are depressed, tell the others who are discouraged, tell the others who are rightfully hiding out. He ain't here. <laughs> He's risen. He's going to hear them. And so in Luke accounts, these sisters go in and get a report. And because the depression is so deep, beloved, sometimes depression is so deep, you just can't believe that there's anything else but depression. That's all around you. They are so depressed, they think that these women are lying, that this is wives' tales. This is foolishness. That's episode one. Then episode two, we got two disciples, not even named, but one of them named Clophus, and they're walking and they're discussing what is happening. Yeshua has this, I don't know, kind of pre Star Trek body or somehow that it just appears. We haven't told them, been told the physics of it. He appears among them. He wants to know what's going on. And they said, are you doing the 
trying to do? Don't know what's going on. And they began to recite what had happened, what had transpired. And Yeshua, in the midst of this, rebukes them in a way of speaking. He said, oh, the Greek says, oh, how stupid and how slow of heart and conscious you are to believe what has been predicted and prophesied. Now, it's interesting. On the one hand, yes, to, yes you're rebuked and chastised them for not believing the scriptures. But on the other hand, he also rebuked and chastised them indirectly because they didn't believe the sisters. Because these two brothers had also heard the sisters' reports. It was just too incredible for them to believe it. So then he begins to instruct them. As he begins to instruct and teach them, he pretends to be going in a separate way and they invite him. And Luke, or whoever the writer of this text is, does something very ingenious. Luke crafts it as though they're having a meal. And if they're having a meal, there's a little micro proto Eucharist here because when Yeshua begins to break bread, it's the way he breaks, it's the technique, it's the words. And I don't know, it's the energy that is emanating when he breaks bread that they begin to recognize who he is. And as soon as they do, he disappears. And then they said, didn't our hearts burn within us? Then our consciousness burned. He burned their consciousness to remember the promises. But not only to remember the promises, but also to actualize them. Beloved, it's not enough for us just to remember we must actualize. And he actualizes and activates them. And then they go and report to the rest of the group, confirming what the women had said. And then we come to the passage before us uh, in the lectionary text. While well, they're gathering, wondering, and just imagine, just like us, some are doubting, some are hopeful, some can believe it, some know it's beyond belief, some say, no, 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 it's got to be true, some say it can't be true. I saw when he killed, I saw when he was buried. Yeah, right there. It was right there in front of us. It was on Roman national TV. We saw it. He's gone. While well, they're fearful while they're wondering, while they're despondent. Here again, he appears among them. And they're terrified. They're amazed. They're joyful. They have tears of joy and they have tears of doubt. The whole range. He said, look at my hands. Look at my feet. I'm the same one they assassinated. I'm this, oh my God, I'm the same, but I'm not the same. You, you, you hear that? I'm the same, but I'm not the same. I'm the same one they put down, but I'm also not the same one who got up. Touch my hands, touch my feet. I'm your brother. I'm your brother. I'm your brother. Y'all got any food? Give me something to eat. Oh, this is deep because here again, the author has crafted this where the first part is a Eucharist. But then the second part when you your extra food is an agape feast. You hear that? It's the Eucharist first with the two. And now it's the agape with the others. Bringing the feast together. Reminding them of the fish and the loaves of bread. In both instances, Luke is brilliant in putting this together. Because where there's a Eucharist and where there's an agape, the people are made whole. And here again, Yeshua begins to teach them from the three parts, or becomes the Tanakh. He teaches them, I don't know how long this took, he teaches them from the Torah of Moses. He teaches them from the Nevi'im of the prophets. He teaches them from the Ketuvim of the poets. Now hear this, he teaches them from the, ne the Torah of Moses, the foundational text. These things must happen. Then he teaches them from the, the seers, the ones who had eyes to see and had mouth to speak about political, social, economic reality, then and now and into the future. And then he teaches them from the rappers, the poets, the artists. These are the words that had to happen. My death is the prelude to my resurrection and shows them as a spoken artist how all of this was knitted together from the beginning up to that very moment. And then, as he has garnered them together, still in fear, still concerned, still wondering, he 
blesses them. He knows how to be a blessing. In fact, remember, when he first appeared among them, or according to some texts, the one that we have in front of us, he said to them, Irene Humin, in the, in the Greek, Irene Humin. Translated back into Hebrew, he says to them, Shalom Lechem. Shalom Lechem. Peace to you. Peace to you in your fear. Peace to you in your doubt. Peace to you in your dependency. Peace to you in your depression. But see, it's not just peace. He's putting the peace on them and in them and through them. When you said peace to somebody, it should be going through them. That's so good, Baba. Shalom. Make those connections for us. Means you be at peace in your body. You be at peace in your emotions. You be at peace in your mind. You be at peace in your spirit. You be at peace as an individual. You be at peace as a family. You be at peace as a community. You be at peace economically. You be at peace ecologically. It's a command. Peace. Shalom. Lachem. To you. And all of you. And isn't it important that Yeshua waits until all of them are gathered together. It's like he guides them. With the angels first, then himself. Is, uh, uh -huh, he's the good shepherd. He guides them to a safety zone, yes. to their hideout, mm -hmm. to their place of refuge, their place of sanctuary. And here's another thing, beloved. When we gather in our place, then the living one appears. Did you hear what I just said? I said when we gather in our place of safety and sanctuary, the living one is already there. Uh, all we gotta do then is see him. Mm. That's why he appeared. He appeared because they were there on one accord. Even in their fear, they were gathered together. He appeared because they were huddled up. He appeared because they were hiding out. But they were not hiding out alone. <laughs> because mm. they were not alone. They were more than two or three gathered together. He was in the <laughs> midst. And when more than two or three of us gather together on any call, in any place, in any circumstance, guess what? He's already there. All we got to do is open our eyes and feed each other. Break the bread. Divide the fish. And there's more than enough. And then we're told that they are gathered and that he leaves after he blesses them and that they go to the temple rejoicing and praising the living one because the risen one huh, had arisen in them. We are, by our history, a resurrection people. And I'll say what I said to my Tuesday class, and I mean it. We also must let go of crucifixion Christology and lift up resurrection Christology. There's a fundamental difference. If you believe that it's all about dying, you're going to die. If you know it's about resurrection, you can't be killed. Listen, now you write are... that down. If you believe it's all about dying, you're going to die. Hey, hey, hey. But if you know it's about living and resurrection, you can't be killed. Mm. That ain't nothing but good. Now, again, we must cultivate the power of listening to our holy sisters 
because they saw something at first that the men just couldn't see. Hear me, it's how they're wired. It's how they're connected. It's how their survival and the survival of a people not only survive, but prospers. They saw before they went to the tomb that something different was taking place. And it was verified when they got there and it was not believed when they told others. Even though Yeshua had sent them as the first disciples, even though Yeshua had sent them as the first evangelist, even though Yeshua has sent them as the first apostles. May we never forget these six brave women who were the first because they were there, because they could see, and because they were not afraid of being either persecuted on one end or ridiculed on the other. And that's just like strong black women. <laughs> Obata, you said it, our grandmamas, big mama. I told you before, and I'm gonna stop here. I remember my grandmama cooking in a kitchen in a Baptist white church. And every day getting those groceries and getting on the bus to bring food to us. And she never missed a day because she saw something that the oppressors could not see. And she made it happen. She made it happen. And as they make it happen, we as a people can and will make it happen regardless of what's around us. And so it is. Ah, say. Word, I say, I say, I say. That was so good. Thank you. Thank I say, you. I say, I say, I say. I say. Woo, that was good. Damn. Woo. I say, I say. Thank you. Ooh, thank you. Thank you thank for that you. message. Mm. Thank you. Mm, thank you. I say. I say. Thank you for that message of no mo. Thank you for interpreting that no mo, that that mm -hmm. word for us. We just thank you, brother. And if you don't mind, if you don't mind continuing with the invitation to. Um, <sighs> if I can find my voice, you know, I'm still in the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> I say. I say. <laughs> This thing's still I'll give you some time. We can stay in the flow. We can stay in the flow. Uh, well, when you I were will. talking about the mothers um, being at the cross, I thought about Mahalia Jackson and she said, were you there when they crucified my Lord? You know, she said, sometimes it causes me to tremble. Tremble, Ooh. tremble, tremble. Yeah. But were you there? Were I was you there. there. Mm. I share. I share. So I will say this, uh, for those of you who are my students, you know this, and for anyone else who's here, uh, Rise Community Church is the place where I have chosen to, to be uh, every Tuesday, every, every, well, every Sunday at 2.30 p.m. is a place that I invite my students to because I believe in what is being done here in terms of not only the present, but the future ministry and the form in which beloved communities and communities of righteousness uh, must take. Because I see the vision and I concur with it. And if you uh, have that impulse, that urge, that feeling within yourself, and you're not a part of the community, I invite you to do so. If you are, I invite you and all of us to continue to uh, renew and steady the course, steady the course, steady the course of uh, what is going on here. Um, you, 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 again, another colleague, uh, Reverend Dr. Lisa Umi uh, 
Alan McLaurin of many names. And let's remember her family this week. Let's remember her family this week. Let's remember her family this week. Uh, but she and her uh, extraordinary COFA lecture uh, talked about the importance of reframing how we understand uh, liturgy in the African-American church. And uh, Baba Daniel Black quoting you, what it means to be Africans in America, not African American, but Africans in America. I love that phrase. Now I have, I have, I have co-opted it. Um, like, and these are just indications of. Uh, I mean, there's so many of us who are present here who have extraordinary gifts for a reason. You must be conscious of your gifts for a reason and for a time and a place, and live up to it. Step up to the crown and step up and be counted for such a time as this, for such a time as this. Sure. So again, I invite you to put your shoulders on the wheel. Yes. Now that's good right there. Put your shoulders on the wheel. Put your shoulders on the wheel, yes. I say, I say, I show, and I, I you bo bo. Amen. Oh, yes. And if we can ask one of our deacons if they could pray for our people, I say. God, thank you for this. Thank you for Sunday. Thank you for Sundays to come to a place that we can flow into our higher elevated cell. God, give us the courage of those six women who knew what they already knew but decided to stay the course anyway, God. For they knew when they showed up that you would be present. God, help us to find the discipline this week to do the things that find us fearful and afraid. Help us to press our knowledge. Help us to press our knowing, God, and help us to fall back on this word when we get married. We ask and pray that you keep us, replenish everything that Dr. Coleman has poured out today, God. Give it back to you. Thank you for all the things and all the knowledge that he's given us, God. How he's dissected and written down the word so that we can understand it and place it in our lives and give us the courage to live and know that we are living and know that we can come down off of that cross. 